Taco Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday. Come on. It's Taco Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. It's Taco Tuesday. Welcome back to another edition of the TacoTuesday.com podcast. Uh, quick shout out to Melissa's Produce. Got the salsa right here. Uh, today, well, I guess uh, I'm your host, Corey. I'm joined again by our favorite guest host, Crawford of The Best Seats. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, uh, Gustavo Arellano. He's very well known as the author of the Ask a Mexican column for OC Weekly. He's also won many awards and accolades, such as the 2006 and 2008 Best Non-Political Column for the Association of Alternative News Weeklies, as well as many others. He has written four books, including Taco USA, how appropriate for this podcast. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. Now, gracias for having me. Of course. So. Tacos. How, tacos. <laughs> Before we even get into the taco conversation, how did you get started uh, in the world of journalism? That was because... In the fall of, was it fall? No, it, it was April Fool's. April Fool's 2000, I was volunteering on a political campaign in Santana for a candidate who turned out to be trash, and now they're a judge, so there's like judge trash. Um, <laughs> but I was, I went to uh, throw something out, and in the trash can was a magazine or a newspaper that I had never heard of before called OC Weekly. So I pull out the paper and it was an April Fool's issue. So it was all like real fake news, not fake, fake news, like really funny headlines and all of this. And there was something called Five Latinos We Really Like. And it was like all these white supremacists and neo-Nazis and racists. <laughs> it was April Fool's. So I thought it was the funniest thing. But the funniest part was that one actual Latino was a Taco Bell Chihuahua dog. And I knew people were going to be offended by it. But I'm like, look, it's a joke. It's April Fool's. It actually works. So I decided to write a fake angry letter to the editor saying, how dare you do this? I'm going to stage a hunger strike outside your offices, blah, 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 blah. And the editor of the OC Weekly at the time, he said, you know, we basically started get, started to talk. And he identified in me someone that I didn't know existed, which was someone who's hungry for stories, willing to go out there and get it, and has enough of an imagination and all these ideas to be able to do something that really represented a side of Orange County that had never been written about before. And here we are, what, 23 years later, I'm still doing this one way or another, but it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah, you, uh, you had a quote. I watched one of, uh, I believe this was with a Google Talk interview. That oh you did. God, I've done you so said, many over the years. I don't, but I remember them all, sure. Uh, Can I drink said, tequila, by the way? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, it's we wanna, encouraged. We, 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 we got to pour. Era dura. Yeah. Fucking legit. Can we cuss on this? Oh, spot? yeah, whatever yeah. you want. Fucking legit. <laughs> no, no, no. This is good. No, no. I, I, I knew I was going to be in for a great time when I saw Era dura here because Era dura is just one of those classic, uh, le one of those legacy brands that are actually legit. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, no, we, I interrupted you. Oh, no worries. <laughs> no, we love Era dura. You can't sing the praises enough for it. But you said, never let your biases get in the way of a good story. Always go for the facts and don't pay attention to the haters. That resonated with me because I love watching sort of political interviews, people discussing the major issues of the world. And unfortunately, there's so few journalists that stick to a code like that. So it's refreshing. To yeah, see no, I, I appreciate that. And that's something that I have always. Cheers, man. Cheers. ASMR. Cheers, guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you just went right for the bottle. That's, yeah, no, that's yeah fine. he is fine. The, that's no main chaser at all. Right there. Speak for yourselves. I don't have to avoid getting drunk today. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good host. No, I look. I have my opinions about things, and, and I've always said my opinions because when we were at the OC Weekly, we were uh, the crazy kids in Orange County. I'm now a columnist with the Los Angeles Times, but as a columnist, I'm allowed to give my opinions. That's literally my job as a columnist. But I don't really think people care uh, people do care about my opinions but i'd rather they care about the stories that i come with because everyone has an opinion why should anyone care about my opinion but not everyone knows how to tell stories and not everyone knows how to find those great stories and that's what i want to care about i want to tell the stories of other people not not the stories of myself but the stories of other people so no i i appreciate you finding those and it's like true like I, again, if I have my opinions and there's something that's in front of me that I know is a good story, but I don't like it because of whatever opinion I have, then I'm not a reporter. I'm a hack. I'm a propagandist. And that's one thing I've never wanted to do. It's like, if you don't like the stories that I tell you, that's fine. But don't accuse me of not of missing out on stories just because they inconvenience me, you know? Yeah. Right. 
Um, we're going to unpack the Taco USA book because obviously we have to, being is where we are at. But I want to ask about the Ask, um, ask a Mexican column, which would later get turned into a publication. Um, and that was what compiled into a book, right? Mm-hmm. How did that come about? And just kind of, I mean, because that was massive. I mean, I went back and looked at a bunch of those because I, again, I'm an active fan of your work. I Thank love you. the newsletter. Again, Thank the, you. The most oh, recent Henry Kissinger A follower one. who, you know, follows my stuff. What a concept. <laughs> uh, but how did that column come about? And what was that like to manage that for all those years? So... Ask a Mexican started right after the 2004 election because, I mean, this is back when journal, you know, newspapers were fat and everyone was picking up the printed edition. Uh, we had a story fall out, so we needed something to fill that hole. And so my editor, his name was Will, well, still is Will Swaim, but Will, he had, we had been talking about doing a column where people, kind of like an advice column, advice columns to this day. Again, even though we don't like opinions, we do like people giving advice for whatever reasons. And in my generation, because I'm old, it was Dear Abby and Ann Landers. Yeah. Then you had Savage Love, Ask Amy, and people, you know, especially now on TikTok, people just give their advice on stuff. And so he's like, wouldn't it be funny to do a column where people, where you give advice about Mexicans? And I did not, I wasn't opposed to the idea. I just didn't think people would find it funny. And, and not, no, 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 it's not that I didn't think it, people would find it funny. I just didn't think people would find it interesting. And that's the thing, as a reporter, you want people to read you. They, you don't care if they hate you or they like you, but read you. But we had a hole, so I'm like, well, might as well, let's just do it one time. So I, 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 go, I go back to my desk and I think, what's the stupidest question someone could ask me about Mexicans? Not the most racist one, not the silliest, but just stupid. And it was something Will would always tell me. He's like, oh, why do Mexicans call white people gringos? And I'm like, we don't call them gringos. We call them gabachos. Gabachos, Gringos call themselves gringos. Like there's no bite to the term gringo anymore. But gabacho still has like eh, a little, you know, a a little more of a, a snap to it. So I wrote it and I figured, well, you know, every advice column, you should you should be polite. So you have to start with dear. It's not me. It's Mexican. So just dear Mexican. And then the response was, dear Gabacho, because you want to be polite as well. So I'm going to call you whatever you are. And if people still didn't like, or if people still didn't get the fact that it was supposed to be a joke, most advice columns have the picture of the writer. But since this was satire, I wasn't going to put my photo. Besides, most people don't think I'm Mexican. So like, I need to find an actual Mexican. So I'm like, let's find the most stereotypical drawing of a Mexican imaginable. And this was actually a drawing that we had commissioned uh, for our Cinco de Mayo issue in 2004, our Why We Hate Mexicans issue, and I was talking about the history of anti-Mexican sentiment in Orange County, sadly, it goes a long way. So this was something that was already uh, stereotypical on purpose. All right, he's our author. Boom, put it right there. So we publish it, and honestly, I didn't expect anything, but we got such feedback, good and bad. People who hated it, people who loved it. White people who hated it, white people who loved it. Mexicans who hated it, Mexicans who loved it. More importantly, though, at the very bottom of the col- of the column, I put, "Hey, you got a spicy question about Mexicans? Because you know we're so caliente." Ask the Mexican <laughs> at, and then then that's where I did put my personal email address. I did not expect anyone to ask me questions. the The column published Thursday morning because that's when we would distribute OC Weekly, and it wasn't even. And I don't. I think back then we would update the website like at two o'clock. Um, by, but by that morning, we would have a 11 o'clock, yeah, 11 o'clock meeting. We already had 50 questions wow. or ask a Mexican. So I go to Will, I'm like, what do I do with all these questions? This is kind of fucking crazy. He's like, well, let's continue the column until there's no more questions to be answered. Well, 14 years later, when I left OC Weekly, I had an archive of every question ever sent to me that I had never answered. I would always de- eliminate the duplicates. I would do, eventually it was, think of it, 14 years, two questions a week, 50 weeks out of the year, because we would, I would do best ofs like for uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. That's a shitload of questions. Along with the best-selling book, half of which were original questions, I still had an archive, Times New Roman, 12 space, no, 12 point single space font worth of questions, 220 pages. Whoa. <laughs> oh my God. I could have continued Jeez. this column, columna, as I say, I could have finished this columna. I could have continued this columna forever, but I did not own the rights to the word Ask a Me- or to the term Ask a Mexican. My, the previous owners had um, 
was it? Tra- I always forget. Trademark copyright. Trademark copyright. <laughs> I, I, one of those fucking things. Uh, co- copyrighted it. And then they gave it to the new owner of the OC Weekly and he wanted to keep it. So I just had to walk away from it, which I didn't regret. But I, bef- you know, I had it saved on the computer at work. And once I knew I had to leave the paper, I just printed all of it. So in my archives, I have all 220 pages left of questions. And there were some crazy, like good and good and bad in a crazy way. So maybe when I'm dead in 50 years, I'll, I'll put like a limit. Like you cannot open my archives until 50 years after I'm dead. <laughs> and then we'll see what happens. See if any of them been answered in the meantime. <laughs> I, I want to get to the food portion of it, but I want to ask just about the column itself, because you said 2004, that was kind of right in that digital vacuum where, yeah, we had email, we had the internet going, but social media hadn't really taken off yet to get 50 questions for a local publication right out the gate. What do you think the response would have been like if you did it today with Twitter and social media reactions and mm. things like that? I, cause here's the thing. If I try to do something like this today, it most likely would have been on TikTok. So it wouldn't have been written. And I don't have anything against TikTok. I don't have anything about against influencers who just do video stuff, but I'm a writer. And I actually did a video version of Ask a Mexican as well. And I, later on, I would do live on the air yeah. radio call-ins. And that was a lot of fun. But I think the reason it hit was the time and the place and the method, which was Orange County, 2004, not as diverse as it was today, but getting there. Still a lot of racism, with which there's still racism in Orange County, but also the writing was very unapologetic, very in your face, very didn't care about political correctness, didn't care about any niceties, didn't care about who it was going to offend. And more importantly, though, swung both ways. Like, it, like, I would trash Mexicans as much as I would trash white folks. For me, I was at the end, Ask a Mexican was a way to expose to stupidity, whether it was from Mexicans or against Mexicans. And sadly, I mean, and you've always had people on both sides who only want to do their own side. But I see now more than ever, especially coming from the left, people don't want to see this type of humor as a way to fight against racism. They think the best way to fight against racism is to scream at it. And no, people want to laugh. People want to get punked. They ultimately do want to get punked. And if they, and if you get them in the right way, they will think. And so my column that had its detractors, uh, people who said like, oh, you're perpetuating stereotypes or you're enabling people's racism. But my response to that is like, look, I could show you all the emails I would get from people, people who would tell me, thank you for your column. You actually, dis, what's the saying? The, uh, this abused me of the racism that I had toward Mexicans, which was crazy. I'm like, really? With my stupid column? Okay. But more importantly, I would have Mexicans who say, thank you for doing this. You gave me hope and you gave me pride in being a Mexican. So I know what I, it's funny because that seems like a lifetime ago. Now I mostly cover LA politics, which is a whole other world. And then of course, Mexican food forever. But like ask a Mexican seems like a whole other galaxy because it was a whole other lifetime for me. And I'm very proud of what I did. And I never get to talk about it as much anymore just because people want me to talk about other stuff. But yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Then turned into a book, turned into two plays, was tried to make, was tried to be made into a television show twice, but it never worked. Move all this stuff that never worked. And it couldn't work because the column was just so weird and so me at the end. Like people don't, people really don't want nerdy shit coming from Mexicans because we're not supposed to be nerds. Go figure. I'm a firm believer in in comedy as yeah. a form of, I mean, almost debate, you know, talking about the major issues in the world. It's because you have two options. You can either laugh about the horrible things that are happening or you can be miserable about them. They're going to be happening no matter what mm-hmm. you do. So if you can bring a little joy, it oftentimes will, will you know, make a light bulb go off in people's heads. Oh, I've been thinking about this all wrong. You know, that joke just resonated with me. It's uh, the two things that make us human are hope and humor. And if you eliminate them one or the other, you're no longer human. You might as well die. And like, and then and it's all gone at that point, especially if you cannot laugh. Mel Brooks, finding humor in the Holocaust, finding humor in Nazis, um, all sorts of stuff. If you cannot laugh, then that is just, you're, you're, you're taking away a weapon from yourself. You're taking away a way to cope. You're taking away a way to, or you're taking away a way to um, go after bad people. Humor is one of the most potent weapons ever. We, I mean, look, when you have true fascists, I'm not talking about pretend fascists, but true fascists, one of the first group of people they go after are the comedians. Yeah. Uh, whether they're the editorial cartoonists, whether they're columnists, whether they're literally the jester, whatever, they go after them because they know, like, I could frighten everyone with, like, my superior military power, with, like, my troops or whatever. 
And these people, how dare they not be scared of me? And how dare they laugh at me? But that's how powerful humor is. And so I will always use it. I will always have it as a weapon, possibly like that in, at my disposal, but different times call for different measures. I do agree mm -hmm. with that. So obviously Taco Tuesday podcast. I mean, this is kind of a perfect avenue um, for anybody that I think cares about tacos at all. Obviously, if they weren't familiar with your work before, they've probably seen you obviously on was it Ugly Delicious with Dave Chang on Netflix with the taco episode you took around him. I want to say what was it? Dan Meehan and the late Jonathan Gold. Was that yeah, who you guys uh -huh. were? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, First of all, I guess let's explain kind of what the book is, first of all, and then we can dive into kind of unpacking how it came about and kind of the catalyst of it all. Yeah. Taco USA came out in 2012 mm -hmm. and it is, I mean, the full name, Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America. So it is a history of Mexican food in the United States and the way it impacts it's every chapter roughly pertains to a decade and roughly pertains to what the major food trend was at the time. So the book, I mean, I start off with a chapter on the food that Mexicans gave to the world, like chocolate, chilies, vanilla, amaranth, um, what else, turkeys for, for lack of better, you know, and, and others. And then the first chapter in the United States, it deals with the first two big Mexican trends that uh, spread across the country. Chili, well, Back then it was called chile con carne. Now it's just good old chili, like a chili dog, chili mm -hmm. burger, whatever, and tamales. And we're talking about the 1870s and 1880s. So people are always surprised. Really? Me Americans were eating tamales all the way back then? It's like, yeah, it, like it is the quintessential Mexican food. And then from there, it just moves on. So, you know, I have chapters to tacos. I have chapters to hot sauces. I have chapters to burritos. I have chapters to um, regional Mexican food, like Oaxacan food and all of that. And as the decades progressed, and it was the first ever a full book on Mexican food in the United States. There'd been a shitload of cookbooks. There's been a lot of Mexi uh, story, uh, books about Mexican food in Mexico. There had been some essays here and there diving into the history of Mexican food in the United States, but no one had ever done the book the way I did. And it was a, it was a bestseller in California. It was a New York Times bestseller, but I knew that this was a book that would sell forever. And it continues to sell. It's, it's never been out of print yeah. because- Americans love Mexican food. We all love Mexican food. The world is now loving Mexican food. And one of the reasons I asked why I also wanted to do the book was, you know, to get people to think, or not to think, but to deprogram themselves when they say, oh, there's such a thing as authentic Mexican food and fake Mexican food and white people. They're just like the dumbest people when it comes to Mexican food. They just want combo plates with, chi with cheese on top of it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. First of all, there's nothing wrong with a good combo plate. That's number one. Number two, it has been, quote unquote, white people, gabachos, who have actually been the biggest fans of Mexican food in the United States and have pushed for all of this authenticity. And also, I just did not like how some people, when you would talk about Mexican food, they would say, oh, you know, poor Mexicans, the white people are ripping us off and they're making all this money. Fuck that. I fucking hate victimhood. I cannot stand victimhood. And so my book gave voice to these Mexicans who had become millionaires, who had become like just brought their culture here and spread it around to the country. Like I interviewed uh, the Lopez family of Gelaguetza, mm -hmm. Gelaguetza, the famous Me uh, Oaxacan restaurant in Los Angeles. Now they're like uh, influencers par none, huge parties with their Volkswagen bus pouring out micheladas and all that. So they're incredible. I'm so proud of what they've done. But I told the story, again, I, I, I've always been about debunking stereotypes. I've always been about going to the truth. And so the story of Oaxacan food in the United States is the story really of the Lopez family. And I talk, and in the book, I talked to their dad, who's now retired, lives in Oaxaca, but still comes up here. Um, and he said, when he first opened up his restaurant, the only people who wanted to try Oaxacan food were Oaxacans and white people because, quote unquote, regular Mexicans, they thought Oaxacan food was crap because it was done by it, like indigenous folks. And so it's like, so I, I present that to, you know, readers and they're like, and I challenge them. It's like, if white people are so, quote unquote, dumb, why are they eating Oaxacan food, which is some of the best Mexican food of them all? And why are they doing it before other Mexicans? Oh, wait, it's because they're not as racist as you think they are. And Mexicans can sometimes be even more racist against Mexicans than anyone else can. So the book just tells all, I tell the story of Tapatio, I tell the stories of how Doritos were invented at Disneyland. Like it's a, I wish I could do an update on it because obviously a lot has happened in the past decade. Yeah. Um. I don't know if it'll ever happen just because I 
have not, I don't want to say I've moved on, but I'm just busy with other things. But I, I'm very proud of that book. It, you know, I still get invited, like on the Taco Tuesday podcast, I still get invited, like, hey, let's talk about tacos. Like, that is something that's always going to be a part of me. It's, it's wonderful. And I get to eat Mexican food. Sorry, I just wanted to say two <laughs> things. I saw, I've watched several of your interviews. You crack me up, honestly. Um, Thank you. But you were talking about first Gringo Bandito and mm -hmm. how you originally threw it in the trash. Mm -hmm. You had some time. You thought about it. Oh, you know, I'll give it a shot. Why it's not give Dexter it a shot? It's from the offspring. Come on. What the hell does he know about Mexican food? <laughs> Turns out a lot. Yeah. And then you had this place in Denver, Colorado that you like to go. And they had their own rendition of a chili relleno. Um, I can't remember La exactly. Fiesta. Yeah. La, I, La Fiesta used to be, I think it was... A big super, which is a, a, a super is a, a grocery chain out there, but it used to be a grocery store turned into a banquet hall. And then it's owned by two brothers and they're like only open. They're only open for lunch. Like, what was it like 11 to two Monday through Friday? Like they don't care. They own the spot or whatever. <laughs> and no, they sell these small chile rellenos that are wrapped in wonton wrappers and then fried. And the cheese in is just like basically milk at that point, yellow milk, all melted and like super hot. And it's absolutely amazing. And that's the other thing that I discovered because I didn't know it myself. As I traveled around the country, because it took me about two years to report it, one year to write it, then it got published. But I didn't realize all these regional Mexican food traditions. I mean, in Mexico, yes, we know Oaxacan food, Baja Cuisine, Sinaloense, the Feño, and all that stuff. But in the United States, you have your own styles of Mexican food. El Paso Mexican is different from New Mexican Mexican, different from Sonoran cuisine in Arizona. Here in California, the food that we, the, the food that they eat in San Diego is different from the food in LA. Like we're talking about people who were born and raised here making their own styles of food. And that, and I mean, even in Colorado, you have Denmex where you have the uh, chile relleno want or chile relleno wontons. And something called the Mexican hamburger, which we would know as a wet burrito. Yeah. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, and there's a hamburger patty inside, which is like so incredible. And then you go down to Pueblo, which is two hours south, and they have a whole other tradition. Completely of different. Have yeah. you been to Pueblo? I grew up in I grew up in that region, oh, Colorado, fuck, from man. Colorado Springs, Pueblo. <laughs> you I know all that terrain. Yeah, the you're, sloppers, you're you're speaking to my heart right chicken now. Chicken taco on white and all that. You see. Well, you could see on camera, but if you're hearing this, he's nodding his head when I say chicken taco on white. And what we're talking about is chicken tacos on a flour tortilla, but Pueblo style flour tortillas. They're like pita bread. It is such an incredible cuisine. And this is the thing. Sadly, there's not enough people from Pueblo down here in Southern California. So if you talk to people about that, like you don't really find that many people. But I've traveled around the country. I know all these cuisines. And the sad, th the interesting thing, it, and I say this sad because the people are inevitably sad. When you tell them, oh yeah, sloppers, no one knows what a slopper is outside of Southern, outside of uh, like Colorado or Southern Colorado. Oh, um, what is it? Sweet pork. Sweet pork is a style of Mex uh, carnitas that they serve in Utah. Sweet pork, like no one knows what sweet pork is in New York. And you tell them that they're like, oh yeah? Oh, like they they get sad, <laughs> they get sad. And, and so, and so my book is this celebration of Mexican food in the United States and the people who love Mexican food. And it trashes the people who hate Mexican food because sadly there are those people, there's always been those people, but it's like Mexican food, the reason why, and this is what I say, it's the reason why Mexican food has remained so popular and keeps increasing in popularity, simultaneously becoming American, but still kind of standing on the outside is because Americans are, they want to try new flavors. Do not try to characterize them as people who are set on their ways, just want like, a, nothing that there's wrong with casserole, but just say on quote unquote, uh, stereotypical white food or whatever the fuck that means. Yeah. But, and Mexican food is that great uh, uh, ambassador to like, hey, let's try something new. And it's really not that new because it's really been part of the United States for God, what? A hundred, what, 20, like 180 years at this point, some shit. I don't know. Yeah, I just, uh, sorry. The reason I brought that up was because I, I think, you know, obviously, when you have another culture bring in their food or their music or whatever, uh, you take to it, you make your own editions of it, you change it, you know, sort of make it your own, but it still comes from, you know, that region or that culture. It, to me, it seems like more of a celebration of, you know, your, their, our neighbors to the yeah. south. It's like celebrating our neighbors' culture, their music, their food, what have you. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I never romanticize things, but I do say, the easiest way to demonize a people is by ridiculing their food. Like you, you're literally saying your food is inedible, inedible. That means 
you're not human, that means we could do God knows what to you. Mm -hmm. But if you enjoy each other's food, you're gonna have to share it at some point. And if you're sharing it at some point and you're enjoying the food, you're probably gonna talk like, hey, like, what is this? Oh, it's blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay, so pretty cool, at least on the food sense. And that's how you start building relationships. That's how you start building strength in communities. Like, no, Mexican food has just been such an underrated, um, what should they say? Ambassador. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. honestly the best way to put it, an ambassador. Again, like I said, I grew up in Colorado. I grew up in Colorado Springs, Denver, very familiar with those types of cuisine. But you're talking about a micro, basically kind of like a micro climate, a micro kind of, I guess, group would be the right way of saying mm -hmm. it, like these kind of regional takes on things. When you were writing this book over two years, it, how did you find those little micro things? Because again, I've had sweet pork before. Yeah. I have family that oh, lives yeah. in Utah. I've had it before. But it's one of those things. See, I'm like, not how lying. the fuck did you find these things? Because nobody, again, unless you're from that region or you know somebody that is, or maybe you see it on TV or something like that, like you just don't see it. Just drive. Driving yeah. around, talking to people. I was lucky because I would travel around the country a lot for free because I was doing the college tours for Ask a Mexican. So people would take me to their food, like, like, and I would tell them, don't take me to a fancy restaurant. Take me to where you folks like to eat. They're like, oh, okay, cool. So they Which is always me. the best advice for travel, by the way. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, t tell the clerk, hey, where do you eat? Where do you drink? Oh, and they get all happy too. Yep. Like, like, I'm not just a tourist. I wanna see, you know, I wanna see what the food is going, the food scene's going on here. And then I just start asking questions. I start to ask questions. Oh, what's this? Oh, what's that? The story I always tell, I went to San Antonio one time and they take me for break. They take me for breakfast. And I see on the menu something. I'm like, hey, what are breakfast tacos? They're like, oh. And they kind of look at me like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, it's a flour tortilla with eggs and beans or eggs and cheese or eggs and uh, chorizo. And then they ask me, wait, you don't have breakfast tacos in Southern California? I'm like, no. Well, what do you guys eat for breakfast if you want Mexican food? Oh, we eat breakfast burritos. And they're like, what's a breakfast burrito? And then I'm like, it's a flour tortilla with eggs and cheese. <laughs> like, I'll feed you baby birds. Come exactly, <laughs> yeah. And that's when, and that's really when it hit me. It's like, oh, people, there's different styles of Mexican food. I need to find what they are. So I was able to, and look, I, I was able to travel a lot for my book. I've traveled way more ever since, obviously, like sweet pork does not make it into Taco USA, but Taco John's does. Uh, the uh, the slaw, I think I had a shout out to the slopper, but not chicken taco on white, but uh, the Mexican hamburger does. So I, again, I'm proud of that book, but I've done so much more uh, work on Mexican food since that I've always been a, an apostle for all these different styles of food. And more importantly, I tell people, don't hate it until you've tried it. Sweet pork is great. Chicken taco on white is incredible. The, you know, Mexican hamburger, incredible. Uh, the, the Wichita taco, which is like hard shell taco with Parmesan cheese on the side. That's a mixture of Italians what? and Mexicans. It's incredible. Don't hate until you've tried it. And also celebrate the fact that we all have these different styles and, uh, you know, and go out there and try them yourself. Go out there. Go, yeah, go out there and try it. You mentioned Taco John's. Yeah. <laughs> so how I'm waiting for you to jump on that. How did you feel about the trademark being released so that all of the restaurants around America are able to have Taco Tuesday? Cheers to that. Cheers. Cheers to the ASMR. Uh. <laughs> uh, uh. Now my sip. Well, first and foremost, I don't like to humble brag, but I, there should be a, little citation in the Wikipedia entry when it tells this story and cite me because in 2000, I think it was 2019 for Thrillist, I did a story about the history of the term Taco Tuesday because Taco John's has always had this whole mythology. We invented the term Taco Tuesday. And I, I talked about that in my book and I thought, oh, this is kind of cute, funny, weird thing. I didn't really realize that they would send all these harassing letters to small businesses, mom and pops places or pubs or whatnot, just who want to sell tacos on Tuesday. And once I started digging into it, you would see they would they would keep changing their story. Like on their, um, they did their copyright or uh, copyright trademark, one of those. I think it's copyright. Um, in 1989 and in the paperwork, they said it was first done. I think it was the late seventies, but the story I always shifts like, oh, this guy did it first. Oh, that guy did it first. So I started digging into it and I noted all these discrepancies 
And then I start doing the research and I find the earliest reference to the term Taco Tuesday, like that exact same term that I was able to find was in a 1969 newspaper in Spokane, Washington. This is way before, Taco John's was barely starting at this point, barely, barely starting. But then I start to dig more because, you know, newspapers are, are capturing what's already out there in the, you know, in the, in the world of what people are talking about, restaurants. I realized that restaurants in the United States have been having specials for tacos on Tuesday, maybe not calling it Taco Tuesday, but the concept of Taco Tuesday, which is a special, they've been advertising those since the 1930s. So somewhere, someone like, it, it, it's an alliteration. It's fun to say. It's easy. And they just combine it. And so I wrote this article. And after that, look, LeBron tried to do his thing in 20, I think 2020. Yeah, it was 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, Taco Bell, which I've always had my issues with. It's not Del Taco. That's my main issue. <laughs> um, or even fucking Bakers and in Inland Empire. But when they announced we're going to free it, I'm like, yes. And, and we're not just going to free it, but we're not going to um, hold on to the copyright. In other words, we're just going to let it out to the public domain. I'm like, thank God. And look, it's great publicity for them. It, it, and, and, and this is one thing I've always said about Taco Bell. They've always been very smart in their publicity. Yeah. They know how to market what they do. And so they knew, like, they can't own – I mean, they have the money for sure to take on Taco John's and the other guy in New Jersey. But they knew, mm -hmm. like, this belongs to the world. This belongs to the world. And so kudos to them. Maybe I'll go to Taco Bell. Finally, just to celebrate. I'm sorry. I was very disappointed by their Doritos Loco Taco. It does not have enough Doritos flavor. Mm -hmm. it, it's not good. It's not good. I want to be coughing that dust. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I seriously. It Fuck yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, and, well, and just a nacho cheese one. I don't need the super hot one or whatever, but I, if I'm going to eat Doritos, I want to taste Doritos. That mm -hmm. does not taste like Doritos, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it, Taco Tuesday is such a big event. You know, it's like. It's like trying to own the trademark for Sunday brunch or something. <laughs> You're going to limit so many restaurants across the entire country's ability to have something that everybody should have. You know, it's a special thing. Every, there's, I got it right here. 13% of Americans celebrate Taco Tuesday every oh. week. Uh, 4.5 billion tacos are consumed in the USA every year. 4.5 billion. We also eat enough salsa to fill the Grand Canyon with oh, six damn. feet of salsa. I so, want to swim in that. I would totally swim in that. <laughs> Throw in some, some Herradura. I'm in. <laughs> Now, look, it is so and, – and look, as an author, I do not want people ripping off what I've written. Uh, I, you know, I get it for companies. They should protect their trademarks, their copyrights. I get it. But you should also be happy sometimes when you create something that the public so embraces, like Kleenex. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, tissue paper or Xerox or a copy A or whatever the fuck that is. Like, no, just be happy. <laughs> People will be saying you're a trademark forever. Be happy that you created something that mankind has embraced. Yeah. That, and so whoever, I mean, again, like talk, Twitter, Elon, it's Twitter <laughs> and we all know it. Ever, ever, ever Twitter. Um, so Taco, and, but this is the thing. Taco John's never invented Taco Tuesday. And so for them to do it, okay, it's smart business, but you're really going to harass other people? Like, come on. And then, yes, they never sued anyone for it. They always would say that, well, we never sued anyone. It's like, okay, but you're still, I mean, you're a small business. You get a cease and desist from a multi-million dollar company. You really think you're not messing with somebody? That you're totally messing with someone. So I lost all respect for Taco John's once I realized what they were doing. I don't think their food is bad. I do love tater tots and breakfast burritos. I think mm -hmm. that's a totally, I'm yeah. actually surprised it's not more of a thing in Southern California. It really I mean, should be. We all, we all grew up eating tater tots in junior high, you know, like well, all of us did. California burritos with French fries. Yeah, exactly. You know, that was a good one. Yeah. And you see, I would say, and California burritos great, but I would say tater tots are better because you have more texture. You have more texture. It's still the same potato, but you have a little bit of fried there. So, uh, you know, so uh, Taco John's can just continue to do whatever Taco John's does. But you are now irrelevant to the rest of the United States. <laughs> your moment, your moment of infamy is done in your face. In your face. <laughs> <laughs> no, and honestly, Taco Tuesday here at a little local place, Flamingos down the road. If they have a Taco Tuesday, it's not detracting any business from Taco John's in what Wyoming. Yeah, yeah, upper Midwest. Like yeah. no, no, no one in Southern California knows what Taco John's is. No one in outside of the upper Midwest knows what Taco John's is. Selling Taco Tuesday, 
the people who are really promoting this are mom and pop operations. Why are you trying to negate any business from these people? Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to mess with the DNA of a good economy in the United States? My wife runs a market in Delhi. We're eating her amazing cornbread, Alta Baja Market in downtown Santana. Go check it out. She doesn't do tacos, but we have friends who run businesses, not even Mexican food, but they'll sell tacos on Tuesday because they know people will come into them. Thankfully, they never got a cease and desist letter. But why would you want to mess with people like that? It's it's absolutely just unconscionable. And like for and for Taco John's who have kept this facade, like we invented it, like it was just stupid. Weak salsa. It was weak salsa. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it kind of reminds me of like uh, the old pictures of Lyndon Johnson. You know, he was such a big guy. Yeah. He would just tower over people and look down and intimidate them. Yeah. Right. So he had no sort of political <laughs> rivals. Yeah, it just it reminded me of that. That's <laughs> funny. That's a very uh, I would not. Lyndon Johnson, by the way, loved his Mexican food. Is Absolutely that right? did. Oh my God. Yeah. I talk about it in my book. You called yourself a nerd earlier, and I'm yeah. a very big history nerd. Yeah. So I just from nerd to nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Um, this is not a political podcast by any stretch of the imagination. No. This is all about tacos and stuff like that. But I do want to ask as somebody who's done so much writing and, and kind of in kind of the political kind of sphere of writing and things like that, obviously covering LA now, which is an entirely different animal. Oh Pour one out for that. Um, Food is, I believe it's kind of the great unifier. Um, the old adage, breaking bread around the table is great, but mm -hmm. food is also inherently political. We're recording this episode, depending on what people end up watching this, um, you know, beginning of December, we're about to be in the new year, obviously election cycle mm -hmm. coming up. Where do you stand on kind of the politics of food? And especially as it, again, Mexico always is a point of contention and a topic for both sides of the aisle one way or another. But I'd love to hear your opinions on food being politicized. I was the only person who defended Donald Trump's taco salad. I was the only person in the United States and I do not like Donald Trump. But when he did his picture, everyone was just trashing him. And what I didn't appreciate was people saying a taco salad is not real Mexican food. I'm like, motherfuckers, the taco salad was invented in Disneyland by the Mexicans who ran Casa de Frito, who also invented Doritos, Mexicans for, Mexican-Americans for the past, what, two generations since then, they've eaten taco salads. Now, most taco salads are not good. No. That, that's that's truthful. My wife makes an amazing taco salad, but she calls it the puro pinche party salad. It is so freaking good. She gets chips, she gets carne adobada. It is so good. It is amazing. It a is good so taco good. salad is an awesome thing. Sadly, not enough of them are. But look, food's always going to be politicized. Um, now, it's interesting because I did, a, I did a story for the 2020 election about how, you know, it used to be politicians. They uh, they still do. They'll go to a bar. They'll get a drink. They'll go to like the country fair. They'll eat a big, huge something on a stick. But now increasingly politicians, they go to Mexican restaurants because Mexican restaurants, especially in the in smaller towns in the Midwest and the South, they are now the gathering places. They're now the banquet halls. They're the places. So like, you know, we're going to have the Iowa caucuses or we had the Iowa caucuses. A lot of these candidates would have gone to a Mexican restaurant, especially when you want to get the Latino vote. You're going to go to a Mexican restaurant. So look, people are going to be angry oh you know you you should not allow these candidates in or whatever it's like what you're going to uh, push away publicity you're going to push away money like these campaigns are going to spend a good two thousand three thousand dollars like hey here we're buying a whole bunch of food for folks go ahead and do it again you're going to negate mom and pop operations the ability to make money like i don't have to agree with you politically but i but i should also not stand in your way of making an honest buck you know so yeah. and you know for, i mean for me though what really gets me crazy with Mexican food and politics are taco vendors here in Orange County in Southern California. Every, and I actually just, you know, I'm going to come out with something for the Los Angeles Times about this variation. I've written about this before. Um, we've always, well, not always. In Orange County, historically, we only had taco trucks in Santana. In Los Angeles, they were kind of all over. After the pandemic, you've had an explosion of, it's not even taco trucks anymore. It's people with one umbrella and one cooler selling tamales or fruit. Yeah. It's folks setting up tents and grills that take up entire sidewalks. And they're all, they're all over Southern California, all over Southern California. I have no issue with that. When it comes to the food economy, I am a unrepentant capitalist on this, in this sense. It's like, dude, if you have a brick and mortar, if you're worried about a poor family selling tacos in front of you, you're just making excuses for your shitty food. That's mm -hmm. what it is. That's 100%. what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's 100%. what it absolutely is. But politicians, 
both in Latino majority cities and not, they are passing all these laws against these food vendors and all of that. Like I always say like, look, oh yeah, you know, they're not paying their taxes. They're not paying their business licenses. They're bringing, they're again, they, they are uh, allowing families to have a livelihood. The only thing I would hit on those uh, vendors, it's like, Clean up after yourself. If you live, a, if you leave a big mess afterwards, then code enforcement has every right to give yeah. you a ticket, one thousand percent. And that's really about it. Other than that, like you want to sell, go ahead and sell. And like here, sadly, in Orange County, the city of Orange has waged war. The city of Santana even has waged war. And Santana, you know, and Santana and Orange are completely different. Uh, Disneyland, Anaheim, everywhere, like they have waged war on these vendors. And in Southern California, street food has been a part of our life since. The, Basically, since we became part of the United States, it is as a part of the Southern California experience as going to the beach or going up to Mammoth or, you know, Big Bear or all of that. So when are we finally going to embrace this? And it's not just Republicans going after these people. It's also Democrats as well. There's, there's bipartisan hate against taco trucks. It's ridiculous. Like if you ever if, if ever there was a case for a third party, it's on taco trucks. Yeah. Yeah, well, because, you know, I know you had at one point said that uh, a lot of people call them things like roach coaches and whatever, trying to get people to avoid them. But some of the best food I've ever had has come from taco trucks. And you were talking about the fruit stands. We have one every summer that is just right outside of my apartment complex. Oh, cool. When it's hot and you get a cold cup of some sliced mango and pineapple, oh, and sometimes they'll even juice it for you. Oh, my gosh. It's got a special place in my heart. It yeah. just hits a sweet spot. Look, the, yeah. old, the four <laughs> times I've ever gotten food poisoning. They were all at high-end restaurants. And I know the last time I did it, I actually had to go to the emergency room because I was basically exploding. And um, the night before, I'm not, well, this restaurant no longer exists, but the night, uh, but I went to this place and I made the stupid mistake of allowing them to, uh, oh, you know, because I, call me a, a brute, but I like my steak well, or my hamburgers well done and my steak well done. Oh, you know, it should be medium rares to really talk about the, the, what, 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 what did they say? The, um, the integrity of the meat. Yeah. Well, that integrity, integrity got me fucked up. Um, <laughs> I have eaten at taco trucks. I've gotten tamales from coolers out of fucking, uh, trunks. I've never gotten food poisoning from yeah. them at all. So it's like health code, whatever. No, no, no. A good restaurant knows you can't poison your audience. You can't poison your customers because word Generally gets around. Generally doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> word gets around and then guess what? You're out of business. People will never go to you again. And honestly, let the free market decide. There was um, a, taco, a, a taco seller. They'd set up a tent right where the parking lot of the Bowers Museum is, right on the corner on Main Street. They would set up there. They set up there for a couple of months. And I'll always try anything. And I tried them like, eh, they're not that good. Lo and behold, a couple of months later, they're no longer there. And they've never come back because the, mar the, the customers are not there. On the other hand, in your house, there's this family that sets up their little uh, taco trailer Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they've been there, God, as long as I've lived there, so about a decade. And it's because they sell great food. It's great food and they're there and it's family run and like I've never been poisoned. Even something as simple as a quesadilla, the salsa they make is fresh. They get better cheese, better meat. And oh my God, it's so good. And I can make a quesadilla at home, but because their food is so good, I go out there and get this. And I'm supporting a family and I'm eating better food that I could possibly make. How is that wrong? How is that wrong? It's not wrong at all. It's not wrong at all. Yeah. I've been writing about food here in Orange County for about six years now and some of the best meals i've ever had have been out of little places up in santa Ana. and like mm -hmm. it, it's just it's phenomenal yeah I, yeah you and i are simpatico in that i uh -huh. fully believe in protecting street vendors and again if you're mad because a cart is you think taking business away from your restaurant then you need to fix your restaurant that's not on that. weak on salsa <laughs> yeah, for sure a hundred percent you know i've been here i've been seeing all these reviews about this uh it's a taco truck but that's they have churros they have like these specialty churros and i'm seeing them every single day i open my instagram app on my phone i'm seeing these churros Probably after this podcast, I'm going to go try those churros Good man. because they just, they're, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a weird segue, but yeah, no, look, there's different, and this is a great thing about Mexican food that you really don't see with other kind of cuisines. You have different levels of Mexican food. If you just want to go to a street stall, you can go. If you want to go to more food hall, you can go to Northgate Gonzalez's new market. Yeah. Like said, if you live locally, it go. It is awesome. Oh my fucking God. It is insane. Oh, it's so good. But you go there. 
If you want a more sit down, you know, kind of uh, El Cholo, El, El Torito, no, El Cholo, El Cholo experience, you could go to that. If you want regional Mexican food, if you want higher end food like Balvinas and here in Laguna, uh, Laguna Hills or El Mercado in uh, Santana, then on the Palcos in Anaheim, you could have all of that. Or if you just want to make it at home, get Melissa's salsa, which always makes good salsa. How about that for a plug? Um, <laughs> and it's true though. Melissa's does good food. Like you could do it all. And that's what is so awesome about Mexican food. And I think that's that's why the American public has always embraced it because it's always been like that. And so yeah. in my book, I have a whole chapter devoted to just like different products. Like it's not as prominent anymore, but the first big Mexican food company was a company called Gebhardt's. Gebhardt's out of Texas, San Antonio, well, New Braunfels specifically, but they're the first people who started selling chili powder. Then they started selling, you know, beans, rice, even canned tortillas. It, as far back as the 1920s, they were doing these pamphlets on how, like Mexican recipes and they were sending it out to like anyone, like you'd have to send in like five receipts or whatever. Uh, but like by the 1920s, they were printing a quarter million of these per year wow. all over the United States. Like the we want to talk about us apostles of Mexican food. It's all, and that's, I mean, and the Gebhardt is named after William Gebhardt, who was a German immigrant. So immigrants have found uh, success with Mexican food who weren't Mexican, white folks, Mexicans. It's just such a great cuisine. And on top of that, it's fucking good. How can you be opposed to it? Even your laptop was surprised. I know. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm a, I'm a bit of a Luddite. I don't know how to use technology. It's okay. So it's I okay. can't turn the Good word off. use though. But uh, I would go as far as to say that it is an objective truth that Mexicans have mastered food and drink combinations. Mm. Tacos with margaritas. I could eat it for breakfast, lunch, dinner. I could have it for dessert. I could eat it before the gym. I mean, it's just. Well, that's actually perfect because I wanted to ask about something and I can segue off of this is you also do. And I look forward to this the way I look forward to like the Super Bowl or the Masters or anything else is for people that don't know your tortilla tournament. Yeah. I want to talk about the tortilla tournament kind of how that all came to be and basically so for people that may not know what is it and how did that come to be because i like when these brackets come out oh, like it is like fantasy in my mind. <laughs> i don't have enough people to play tortilla fantasy but i want to so if hey, anybody's you down do get at me. You, you could win a prize <laughs> um so this started in 2018 my dad's side of the family they're mostly based in montebello in east la and so my dad was a truck driver he's retired now and so he would always bring tortillas like from different places that he'd go, I, I, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because in retrospect, you, you know, it's not until later on in years you realize like, oh, our parents are pretty cool, you know, what they were doing. And so he would always bring like different styles of or different meat to make carne asada or carnitas and also different tortillas. So we ended up settling on these amazing corn tortillas from a place called Miramar Tortilleria off of Union Pacific in East L.A., East L.A. near Boyle Heights. And so we like once he brought he, once he brought them in, I'm like, oh, my God, these are really good. And then one day I look at the label and it says, Desde 1951, since 1951. And I'm like, damn, this family has been doing it for that long. What's its story? And then it's it, like a light turned on in my head because I realized like, oh, there's all these tortillerias all around Southern California, all around the United States. Restaurants advertising, they, they make them hechas a mano, like made by hand. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know that history. And then as a reporter, you always want to do things in an innovative way. So like I could have done like a listicle and they've been done in the past, but I'm like, there's so much. And people always want to know what's the best, what's the best of anything. So I'm like, and I'm a big sports fan. So then I'm like, well, why don't we do a tournament? And so I pitched it to KCRW, which has been my radio home for 20 years at this point. God bless them. But no one knew what a sports tournament was because they don't follow sports. But I found my, I finally found my, my main boss and he knew what it was. So I said, let's do it like a sports style tournament, probably most prominent, like NCAA final four men's and women's basketball or the FIFA world cup, the knockout stage where you get, let's do 64 tortillas, 32 corn, 32 flour. You break them up into four brackets of 16 and then you seed them. So like the best tortilla that you think exists goes up against the worst tortilla that you think exists. Number two versus number 15, blah, blah, blah. They go, he goes from 64 to 32 to 16 to eight. And then for the four finalists, let's make them make tortillas live. Let's have a tortilla festival involved. And so we did in 2018 and it was such a ludicrous idea. People had no idea what it is, even to this day. I mean, obviously you're getting fans. So thank you for caring about it. But at first they're like, wait, what? 
seeded tortillas, matchups, huh? That's the first two rounds. Then round of 16, finally people get it. Now they start cheering like, oh my God, we got to do more. And so it's a parody of sports. So I'm like, well, you know, they, we need a trophy. So let's create the golden tortilla. And then last year we introduced something called the Chiquihuita Cup. So a Chiquihuita is the name for uh, the basket where you put, where you put tortillas. So we did, a, uh, we, um, it was a 3D print, it was a 3D printed uh, Chiquihuita, but we put it on a pedestal like the Stanley Cup. So big, huge fucking thing, just so we could have the winner, like yep. pick it up like that. <laughs> this year we had a People's Choice Award and People's Choice, like this small little thing, the bronze comal. Comal is the griddle where you put the tortillas. So every year I just want to up the craziness. Last year also, um, I'm like, okay, you could never run out of tortillas in Southern California. And by Southern California, by the way, I mean all the way out to Santa Barbara, all the way down to the Coachella Valley, down to Orange County. But then I thought, well, San Diego is its own scene. Like it's a totally different scene. So I decided to do a San Diego Invitational last year. I started with just, what was it? 16 tortillas, eight corn, eight flour. This year I expanded to 32. So the four finalists, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the two corn and two uh, flour finalists, they make it into the bigger tournament, the tortilla tournament. So it gets very confusing very fast, except for me and except for the people who care for it because then people start going nuts. And this is a way to celebrate tortilla culture in Southern California. This is a way to tell people like, you don't really have to go that far to eat good tortillas. Like you could go to... Walmart or Stater Brothers, they sell a brand called Romero's. Romero's is a mom or a family-owned company that's been making tortillas since 1965 out of Santa Fe Springs. It's actually my go-to tortilla for quesadillas because quesadillas is one of my favorite meals ever because it's it's kind of like the Pueblo-style flour tortillas, like yeah. a thick tortilla. Is it the best flavor? No, but it's a good enough flavor. And like you can buy at Walmart or Stater Brothers, and those are all over Southern California. Like people do not have an excuse. To not, I mean, this is all these double negatives, but people do not have an excuse to not be eating good tortillas. Like you don't have to go to the high-end restaurants all the time. They're there. And I, I'm not going to take too much credit for this because I'm very good at sensing vibes and sensing where scenes are going. So I just, I merely just documented what was going on first in Southern California and now all over the United States, which is there's a renaissance in great tortillas. People are learning how to eat great tortillas and it has just been incredible. Um, I will continue it as long as God allows me to. Simple as that. I mean, that's really my life's work at this point. I just want to focus on tortillas and we're expanding it. I can't wait until eventually we get to Arizona and then maybe five years, Texas. That's going to be fucking crazy. That won't and be I'm, competitive at all. Yeah. <laughs> Texas is going to be like a whole year of just like figuring them out. Cause like El Paso tortillas are different from Dallas tortillas, different from tortillas in the Rio Grande Valley. And look, you have now tortilla makers in New Hampshire and Minnesota, obviously Denver Pueblo has its own flour tortilla scene. Like it is so incredible. And it is such an interesting way to document a region through its tortillas. It really, really is. So people, more and more people are, are loving it, but like if, as long as KCRW allows me to do it, then I'm going to do it. I mean, the only thing that's comparable would be like, and again, I, I grew up in an Irish household. I married an Italian, which is why oh I've, never, I've, I've never won an argument. <laughs> um, it's like sourcing pasta. Like Italy has different pasta styles yeah, because yeah. It, again, it's only as, like a taco is only as good as the tortilla that it's served on a lot of the time. And now 100%. you have you know, brands like Masienda coming out and people are making like more and more tortillas and it's available. I mean, shit, they're selling masa in Whole Foods. Yeah. Never saw that one. That was not on my bingo card. No, but yeah, it's like, it, but it's fantastic. Who were the and what? Who were the recent winners for this year? Well, you had for so the four finalists on corn. It was actually and there's different styles of tortillas. So we had our first ever Central American finalist, Pan Victoria. It's a Guatemal Guatemalan, um, like a deli. So like you know they have a lot of hot trays and it's really Guatemalan food is super good. So they're based in mid city. So. And, and Guatemalan style tortillas, they're small and they're thick. And oh my God, they're so fucking good. Uh, and so the way you eat them, like you rip them up into little parts and you sop stuff up. So they were against the perennial winner, Taco Maria, yeah. the Titan, the fucking God of all gods. So they were the finalists. Taco Maria won. And then in the flour tortilla, you had home state, home state, Tex-Mex style tortillas, great breakfast taco chain. Now there's, I think they have like eight locations ar across Los Angeles. They went up against Heritage Barbecue. And everyone loves Heritage Barbecue. Shout out to Danny Castillo. Hell yeah, Danny. What's up, young blood? <laughs> um, he, at his location in San Juan Capistrano, he uses tortillas from Burritos La Palma, which has won before. 
But in his Oceanside location, he makes fresh flour tortillas and they're absolutely amazing. He uses beef tallow. So that gives it a whole because and, and it's interesting with flour tortillas. Flour the corn tortillas are mostly the same. There's there are some differences, but mostly like it's corn, water, and lime. That's all you need. Flour tortillas are always going to be completely different because you have you have to use different. I call it binding agents. I mean, you're, you, you guys are more of the foodies than I am, but like, it's just like the fat that goes with it. That binds everything. So you can use everything from vegetable shortening. Like, um, so it's interesting. Our previous flour winners. So Burrito La Palma uses um, vegetable shortening. So Nora Town, which was our first winner, they use lard, which is a traditional thing. A uh, home state uses butter. And then Heritage uses tallow, beef tallow. So you have all these different flavors, all these different varieties. But Heritage ended up beating Homestay. And then in the final, Taco Maria took the Chiquihuita Cup. They're the first two-time winner. And I immediately banned them from the tournament. I'm like, all right, congrats, you won. You're now banned. Except every four years. So it's not going to be 2024, but in 2025. So every four years, we're going to do something called the Tortilla Tournament of Champions. So if you like soccer, it's like the Champions League. It's like, all right. All, so I'm going to do aggregate. All the people who have ever won, you're coming back in. Because this is the thing about the Tortilla Tournament. The only people who can ever come back, you have to place in the round of 16. We call it the Suave 16. If you do not place in the, if you place in the round of 16, you move on to the next year. If not, then you're out. Unless it's the, unless it's the tortilla tournament of champions, and that's gonna be fucking crazy because you're gonna bring in like some like there is my favorite flour tortilla in Orange County is a place called Jimenez Ranch Market in Santana off of Maine, right across the street from the Chase Bank off of Washington. Um, they only make their flour tortillas Thursdays and Fridays, and you have to pre-order them if you want to be guaranteed a tortilla, like a pack of tortillas. Um, they, they'll have some in the cash register, like whatever leftovers you ha they have, but like if you want to have a guaranteed tortilla or packet from them, oh my God, they're handmade, so they're regularly shaped. Thick, not too thick. They have this powder on them, very weedy. They're so amazing. They've not, they've never gone farther than the SOA, the eight finalists. They've never, so they've never made into the Fuerte Four, but they're an amazing tortilla. Imagine them as a number 16 seed. That's not a number 16 seed you want. <laughs> but the, so I can't, like, I can't wait for 2024, but I'm really waiting for 2025. You have Grand Theft Auto 6 coming out and you have fucking the Tortilla Tournament of Champions. So that's going to be the glory year. Do you play video games? Uh, I don't have. I used to play them more when I wasn't a reporter mm -hmm. just because I'm just too fucking busy to do so. I mean, it's funny now, like I, I have it on my computer. Don't ask me how, but I have baseball stars. I used to be on Nintendo where it was like the American dream yeah. versus the Japan Robins who always beat me <laughs> motherfuckers. But Grand Theft Auto, I think is one of the greatest things we've ever done. It is such an incredible satire. It's, it's Brits sat <laughs> satirizing yeah. the United States. So Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to be in Miami, Vice City already. You saw that, like it was like a two minute uh, trailer and I'm like freaking out. It's like <laughs> there's going to be a Cuban woman with like her white boyfriend. So it's going to be Bonnie and Clyde style. Mm -hmm. And I did like there, there's people twerking on cars going down the highway there. And then there was an alligator going through like their 7-Eleven. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I want to play this game already. And you know, it's, it's going to be Vice City. So there's probably not going to be tacos. It's okay. You know, you're going to have lechon and you're going to have pastelitos and all that. Cuban food's great too. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I did hear that they have like some AI in that new. I've never really played the Grand Theft Auto games, but they have AI with the characters, so the characters aren't going to be like nobody does satire like Rockstar. Oh my, God. nobody, no, nobody. No. That Red Dead Redemption and all that, but Grand Theft Auto, incredible. I love that the you said the Brits are the ones. It's like a satirical from the Brits. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I mean the Brits are second place. It's uh, we're sorry about 1776. But, uh, <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> oh man, I love it. Yeah, no, no. So I mean. So the tortilla, and, and I think that's a, the tortilla tournament is really like, if I want to humble brag again, it's a testament to sort of what I bring in terms of my career, which is I always try to do things because I, I teach at Orange Coast College in journalism. And I tell my students, you always want to be first to a story. You want to give people a story they've never heard of before. Or if you're going to do something that has been done before, do it better than anyone. So there's been tortilla lists like, oh, best tortillas. Like, no, I'm going to bring you like this thing that is just so out of your world. And 
It's advocating for the mom and, you know, the mom and pop places like anyone who makes tortillas. Like there's like, again, like I'll, I'll, I'll advocate for a big company if they make good food. Like Macienda is now multi-million yeah. and he does a great product. Jorge does great, great products. I give him a shout out or I give him a blurb for his cookbook and all of that. Like I'm always about, and I think people should just always celebrate the good. Always go out of your comfort zone and always try to think about things differently. And also, yeah, go against the bad. Don't patronize the bad. And by the way, it's not, again, it's not just white people. The most popular brand of tortillas in the United States for non-Latinos, it's Mission Tortillas. For Latinos, it's Guerrero Tortillas. They're both owned by the same company, uh, Gruma. And we lionize them in the Mexican community. We don't know better. We don't. I mean, there's, a, you want to talk about politics. That's a whole other conversation, but- <laughs> We are all we are all sinners, but we can all be saved. That's what I truly believe in at the end. I like that. It is true. Okay. I just wanted to bring up, I was looking at your Wikipedia page, and something really Fake stood out. Fake news. Might be the most important fact about you, but uh, we'll leave that I open know, for I think I know. I think I know what you're about to say. I, I, I think so, too. Uh, yeah, well, it. it's, uh, you are the third cousin once removed from Jessica Alba. How, I mean, is there like a big story behind that, or is that just... Uh, a thing that you learned one day and thought, eh. No, literally. <laughs> um, I got an email from a fan who said, you know, big fan, blah, blah, blah. I'm related to you. And um, Jessica Alba is related to you. I'm like, wait, wait, what? Huh? <laughs> like a lot to unpack in this email. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Seriously. This is like about, I, I wrote about it for OC Weekly maybe a little bit over a decade ago. And so, and she gave the family tree. Like, she, like it was a breakdown. So it turns out Jessica Alba's father and me, so we're the same, even though he's way older than me, we're the same like lit, like generation on the family tree. We both share the same great, great grandfather. And I can, I think his name was Placido Miranda. Cause hold on, let me think. Cause my, my grandpa's Papa He, my great grandfather is mi Papa Sabas. And I think his name was I think it was Placido Miranda, but like, so we did that. So, you know, so Jessica is below me. And then after that, I'm like, okay, like in the American mind, like, what is it? So it's technically third cousin once removed. I've never talked to her. None of that. <laughs> she didn't, she mentioned her, and this is from her dad's side. So she mentioned, I think her mom's side of the family. Cause she came in, uh, she came out on the PBS show, finding your roots or whatever with Henry Louis Gates. So it would have been cool if she had, I mean, she was not going to mention me, but it would have been cool if she mentioned our side of the family, but it's like, it's cool. And so I talked to this person and it's interesting because I ended up meeting someone else who's part of that same family, like their branch of the family. They've actually had a lot of cool people. They've been like NASA scientists, their professors. One of them is actually in Pueblo, University of Colorado Pueblo, um, uh, you know, in Brown University. So it's a really cool family. And so it's cool to be related to them. But like one of them I've gotten to know and she's like, like, does Jessica come to family parties? And she's like, no, she can't because she's kind of busy, but she always pays for everything, for the mariachi, for the taquero and all that. So I'm like, that's really cool. Because now, you know, that was cool. obviously mm -hmm. she became famous for her work, but now she's like a fucking super rich person because of the Honest Company, yeah. like everything that she does. But it's cool to see that she has not forgotten her family and she cares about these things. So like that made me happy to know, you know, that made yeah. me really happy to know. Yeah, so no, no, so yes, that part of Wikipedia is true. I was never publisher of OC Weekly, but let them say that. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> let them think. Okay. I knew uh, you were going to ask about Alba. <laughs> oh, I, I couldn't I not. I mean, it's fair. in my notes, so I had to Why not? bring it up. Uh, quick shout out to your wife, Delilah. She owns and operates the bakery Alta Baja in Santa Ana. Market it's and like Deli. A, a specialty food store, Market and Deli. Uh, that is. She provided this cornbread, which is delicious, by the way. And I was just telling him, I never put butter on things. Yeah. But the butter on the bread. It's because you don't like is, to be happy. I, I just like to, yeah, be perpetual. It's, it's a honey butter. No, and then it's, uh, we get, or she gets a cornmeal from New Mexico. So that's why it's blue. Mm -hmm. It's a blue cornbread. And she's had it now for 70 years in downtown Santana, Market and Deli. So you can go there for a good breakfast and brunch. She has the largest collection of Mexican wines in Southern California, sells products from Colorado, from Arizona, indigenous owned. Uh, she likes to say that everything from the, from the beers, to the hot sauces, to the baskets, to the, right now it's, uh, you know, the holidays. So Christmas ornaments, everything has a story and every, and, and that, cause she's a small business person. 
So she wants to support small businesses as well. Yeah. And like we, no, she, we have seen success stories. Like we were carrying Macienda when it was nothing. Now it's super huge, but we're so cool with Jorge. So it's really, literally the only mainstream stuff she sells would be like Topo Chico and Mexican Coke. That's it. You know, but if there were to be like an indie Coca Cola or Cola style drink, she would sell as well. So now she's awesome. She's incredible. Uh, her food is absolutely good. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. I stop up there anytime I'm there. At re real talk for anybody who's local, the plug aside, go. And especially, I, ju I just did a press trip to Valle de Guadalupe, the Mexican wines. Yeah. You, you will be the talk of your holiday party. Or you'll at least survive it. <laughs> so. All right, you guys. Gustavo Arellano, thank you so much for coming on the show. Man, you were super fun to talk to. Gracias. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the TacoTuesday.com podcast. Happy Taco Tuesday. Cheers, everyone. Tuesday. Taco Tuesday.